out how you where you found Hi, that. So go into go into Hi, your Lenora. go into your video settings. Go click the little up arrow by the stop video, and then go into video. Uh, choose video filter. Right. Oh, nice, Carlisa. I like that. Use video filter. And then just try some of them. Background filters. Virtual background. Brian has the northern lights behind him. Mine is saying mm -hmm. none. None? Really? Try out new filters. Nothing? Uh, it says mustache and a beard. Oh, try it. We'll just <laughs> click on it and see what happens. <laughs> click on it. I don't know. I can't really see because I'm outside and there's glare. Well, there's nothing on your screen. Nothing has changed about you. Mm -mm. I just can't see because I've, I've done this for work. You have? On Zoom, uh, not on Zoom, but on uh, Microsoft Teams. I don't see where they are, Ruth. Where, where on here are you? Choose things? video filter. Yeah, I'm there. And don't you see filter. don't you see these little things, these little boxes and things below that? No, I don't have any. You don't? No. Nope. Mine says none. It probably is my work software probably blocks anything good. This is where you get the kitten video. Remember the guy that was on the, the lawyer who had the cat video on him? Oh, yeah. Here's the mustache. <laughs> How do you get the fly, like, uh, landed on? Oh, Pence. the fly on the head? <laughs> what oh, the heck is his name? Mike Pence. Oh, my God, that guy. Mm -hmm. I clicked on studio effects at the bottom right, and that's where I got uh, eyebrows, mustache, and beard. Oh, okay. But it, I don't know how to use it, but. Hmm. I can show you my. This is so fun. This is really fun. Oh, there you go, George. <laughs> <laughs> you right. have to download this? I don't have it. Yeah, oh, I, don't. I, don't, I don't know. I don't know why you don't have it. No, it should be on that filter. You go to choose video filter. Yeah. And then you select video filters? Yes. yes. No, I got none here. Huh. It asked me if I wanted to download. <clears throat> and I Studio did. Video effects. <laughs> Not seeing it. I don't have it. You probably should be thinking about more important things. Okay, yes. Let me let me stop this right now and get to our prelude right now. Oh my god, the bow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, let to uh, mute you, Lenora. Let's see. Uh. Good morning.
words cannot express it All the ways you reign supreme Even death can't hold the vastness Nor approach this awesome thing You are God and to your glory We will worship and abide In your presence there forever We'll be happy to Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome good morning. to another good morning. Good morning. Zoom experience. <laughs> I'm getting so tired of Zoom. Can't take it anymore. Um, there we go. Would somebody unmute themselves? and read our vision statement and another person read our mission statement. Vision. As a faith community, Westminster DC's vision is a world where the justice, equity and love that Jesus taught and lived by are enjoyed by all. Mission, Westminster DC's mission is to walk with those fighting for justice and equity, to be an ally for truth, reconciliation and inclusion, to be a community center for civic actions and activities and promote the holistic well-being of everyone in the Southwest DC and beyond. Amen, amen. Our call to worship today comes from Isaiah 55. So let me ask three people to unmute yourselves and read uh, these verses in the paragraph form that they are. Can somebody do that? I will. Ho, oh, everyone who thirst, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come by and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, for your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Someone else. Incline your ear and come listen and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Who else? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Let's pray. Yeah. First of all, God, we are grateful for this day. We are grateful for this beautiful, sunny day that brings us um, 
inspiration and hope for better days to come. Oh God, we are grateful that you have brought us into this Easter season that continues this day and for days forward. Oh God, we are your resurrection people and we are struggling and striving to really comprehend what that means and to follow you in that way. Oh God, be with us, guide us, lead us, be with us in all that we say and do together. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Come to our time of confession today. Um, I'd like to share a, a poem with you that comes from a young man who was born and raised um, in the DC area, Prince George's County, um, attended Suitland High School. At the age of 16, he made uh, a, a very serious mistake 
um, when he and a friend carjacked um, a car uh, in Virginia and he was uh, tried and convicted as an adult sentenced um, to nine years um, of which he, he served most of that. Um, and while he was there, he also spent about 14 months in solitary confinement. While in prison, he started reading and writing poetry, completed his high school education. When he came out, he went to PG Community College and then Warren Wilson College and finally to Yale Law School. And uh, he is now a lawyer, a uh, member of the bar in the state of Connecticut. And he has become a fierce advocate for incarcerated youth. And he uses uh, teaching and, and poetry as a tool. So I'd like to share with you one of his poems um, that he titles Behind Yellow Tape. And um, I have to apologize for the bad language in this, um, but you know, the world is using bad language and we need to, um, need to kind of wade our way through that. This poem behind yellow tape, tape uh, from his new collection of poems called Felon Poems. Half what they say about what they'll do with the ratchet is a lie. The weight of death worn so near a man's crotch can't help but fuck with him. But who among us had a holster? Had been before a firing squad. None of us laughed when Burris shot himself. We knew a few who blew small holes in clothes, feet, sheet rock, while reckless with a burner off safety. That danger and prison should have made me pause. But statistics ain't prophecy, and ain't none of us expect to be in the NFL or a cell. The truth somewhere between. Like when me, Thomas, and Sam's brother all beat the shit out of that boy with a lopsided edge up. At first, it was a fair fight, and for real, Thomas just wanted to break it up. But the boy struck back, and it became, fuck it. Intervention turned intervening. Or like how I felt Slim ain't deserved the grave no more than his killer earned those 78 years. But that don't make the prison they turned into the killer's tomb slavery. We all standing on the wrong side of choices. When we stomped and stomped and pummeled that boy we carried massacre in our eyes. Half of all of this is about regret. A cage never followed my smacking the woman I love. But for kicking a mud hole in that kid, we'd become felons. All the stories I keep to myself tell how violence broke and made me, turned me into a man can't forget the face of a young boy bleeding out as if his blood would make the scorched asphalt grow something loved and beautiful. Would you unmute yourselves as we pray together? Merciful God, uh, forgive us our sins. Forgive us our heartedness, our callousness, our violence we so easily despise as practicality and necessity. Open our hearts to all those with whom we share air, water, light, and possibility. Help us for the end, heart growing into love, just as a budding blossom turns itself for the sun. Oh, loving God, hear our prayer. From this familiar passage in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul teaches us this. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. 
For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Brothers and sisters, may the peace of Christ be with you all. And also, and also with, with you. you. Please share that peace. Peace. Peace, Peace, everyone. Peace, Ricky. Peace, Dad. Peace, Mike. Hello, hello. Dean and Eric. Hey, Eric. Everyone. Everyone. Oh, good morning. Peace, Dad. Good morning, everybody. Everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Anne. Hi, Sandy and John. Ricky, Anna, Anna, everyone. Hi, Debbie. Everybody, Debbie. Alice. Hi. Mari. Hello there, Mari. Peace. Meg. Richard. Good to see you, Richard. John. Mary Zell. Ella. Marcia. Marie. And Benita. Everybody. Where are you there? Savannah. Good Peace, morning. everyone. Hey, John. There's John. In the, are you in New York? <laughs> Where are we Great seeing to this? see you. Jill and John. Oh, hey. wonderful. Man, we've missed you guys. Oh, there you yeah. are, John. How are you? You look fantastic, both of you. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Great to see you. <laughs> Can't say prayers. thank you. Are with Bob List to this morning. Okay. Can't be with us, but uh, Jean and Eric are together. It's wonderful. And Meg. So we'll share a song. I know my Redeemer lives. Amen. You're muted, Brian. There we go. I want to share with you now uh, this uh, passage of scripture, which comes from Luke's gospel, the 24th chapter. And this is um, one of Luke's appearance stories um, after Jesus was raised from the dead. The um, account of the uh, journey on the road to Emmaus. Listen for the word of God. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem that does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. They did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. 
Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter, then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Would you pray with me? Merciful God, we are struggling to live into this new reality that you have brought into our world. This reality is that love and peace and justice and mercy is conquering everything else. So God, help us to be the resurrection people you have ordained us to be. Help us to bring all of these things into our places as we continue to witness of what we have known and seen of what you have done for and with us, O oh God. Be with us this day. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So today we are in uh, the second Sunday of Easter. And it probably needs to be emphasized all the time because of the power of the Easter bunny and other such things that Easter is not a single day event. Easter is a process. Easter continues until Pentecost in our liturgical calendar, but it is something that infuses our life with meaning and purpose every day. When I was in high school, I, um, I found it necessary and important to share the love of Jesus with a lot of my classmates. And so I uh, usually had a copy of the four spiritual laws in my pocket, was always eager to have that conversation. But one of the responses I always got when I ever wanted to discuss scripture with anybody was the pushback that people would say, I can't take this seriously. The Bible is loaded with contradictions. It says one thing here and another thing somewhere else. And in a very real sense, we have to admit that scripture is problematic. It is at moments complicated. But people who doubt Christian gospel also doubt Christian practice and with very good reason. Why would they want to affiliate with many of us who proclaim the risen Lord while practicing uh, a lifestyle that promotes death and destruction for so many people in the world. Maybe you've been following the exploits of the, uh, the powerful woman uh, evangelist of the Southern Baptist Convention, Beth Moore. Uh, she recently left the Southern Baptist Convention. I believe it was after January 6th. Uh, she had been disturbed even as far back as the release of the Axios tape and that revelation uh, back in 2016. Um, but she stayed there, she stayed in. Now she's left the denomination after the 6th of January. And just recently she has apologized for many of her teachings and much of her compliance with Southern Baptist theology and thinking specifically around the issue of complementarianism, which a lot of conservative evangelicals uh, use as a way of saying that uh, men uh, are um, ordained by God as a, uh, a superior uh, to women. And that women's role in the universe is to 
be a helpmate, but certainly subservient. She came to the point where she couldn't take that anymore. And I'm glad she did. I think she is uh, crossing a line and uh, transcending that boundary in a good way. But we have to recognize that when we come to these different New Testament accounts um, of the resurrection, of the uh, appearance stories, of uh, the different gospels, they're all different. Uh, Mark has no appearance account. Matthew has two. Luke has two. John has four. We have to recognize that scripture is oral tradition. It comes from oral tradition, meant to preserve and propagate the meaning of Jesus within particular communities. And they all wrote at different times. But in our world, the way we read these accounts is through our 21st century lenses. We demand precision. We demand evidence to make reasonable and truthful assertions. This is the lens that we wear in Western culture. Not everyone does that. Philosophers and theologians talk about texts that really matter as having, in many cases, a surplus of meaning, surplus of meaning. We look for those. And we always want to know what's the bottom line? What's the, the real point of all of this? So as resurrection people, we have to ask, what does Easter mean? We know the stories in the accounts, but what does it really mean? Is it about resurrection? Is it about transformation or is it just about Easter bunnies and new clothes and things like that? And what do you suppose it meant for Cleopas and his friend as they were walking along that road? It seems maybe that they were going back to their lives as they'd known them before. They were resuming the normal, the commonplace that they were very familiar with. But when Jesus came up behind them and asked what they were discussing, they couldn't believe that he didn't know. They had, in a very real way, a surplus of meaning happening right there for them. Because of the trauma and the tragedy, maybe they became myopic. Maybe they were so zoomed in on what they were trying to figure out they, they didn't see what was going on around the edges. But then Jesus began to teach them, interpreting the prophets, interpreting their tradition, their sacred text. But even then, they still didn't recognize him. Only when they ate together, only when Jesus accepted their invitation to stay with them to eat, as was custom at that time, when he took bread and he blessed and he broke it and he gave it to them, only in that moment did they recognize who he really was. Luke is making a theological point here. The communion has a surplus of meaning. It's important. And it is attached to what we understand uh, to be the work that Jesus was all about. It is the practice, the ritual that he left us to hold on to. It has a surplus of meaning. I don't know if any of you are following this Derek Chauvin trial in Minneapolis. Uh, I've been trying to watch some of it, but frequently I just have had to turn it off and look away. It is just so horrifying. But the one thing I think I'm always gonna remember about this whole thing is George Floyd's baby daughter making that claim, daddy changed the world. What is that little girl gonna know about her father other than the fact that he became a martyr? Whether he is vindicated or not, that is what that little girl is gonna have, have to hang on to all of her life. 
the death marks her family, marked her family so decisively. But this trial is such a chess match, isn't it? I mean, a conviction, despite all of the evidence, is still very difficult. It only takes one juror in our legal system to stop it. Despite all of this graphic video and this expert testimony, a large number of people will want to accept the defense argument that Chauvin was justified because the horrified onlookers were yelling at him as he choked George Floyd to death. Our commitment to American exceptionalism runs so deep that still over 60% of Republicans accept the big lie that our ex-president propagated, that the 2020 election was stolen from him. And over 50% believe the new big lie, that it was really left-wing radicals, Antifa, that was responsible for the insurrection that happened on January the 6th. And that the MAGA people were really just peaceful, were really just expressing their First Amendment rights. They weren't the ones who barged into the Capitol. It was some left-wing conspiracists who were doing that. I tell you, I'm not sure I want to go to Bible study with folk like that. I'm not sure I got the strength to try and build communion with folk like that. I'm going to need a whole lot of support to do that. But you and I have to ask that question. How does Easter inform our thinking? Does it have any impact at all to how we live our everyday life? This is what it means to be a Christian, is to constantly wrestle with what God has done through Christ in our world. We have to remember always when the Gospels were written down. Matthew was written in the 70s, um, not long after the Romans finally and decisively destroyed Jerusalem because of the Jewish revolt. Matthew and Luke were written in the 90s. John was written um, somewhere around a decade into the second century. Mark was a primary source for the others who adjusted them to make their own needs uh, uh, fulfilled and to address and be meaningful for their own audiences. But there's no mistake that the gospel writers understood the corruption of the Roman system of oppression and domination and told their stories with that context in full view. They understood the world as it was. So remember back again when in Mark's account of Palm Sunday, while Pilate and his army was marching into Jerusalem from the west, with armaments and symbols of the lordship of the emperor in full display, Jesus was riding in from the east on a donkey in a nonviolent procession of resistance and protest to the death pronounced and promoted by that occupying Roman establishment. I was never taught that in Sunday school. I was never taught that perhaps we today, the United States, is the new equivalent of the Roman Empire. Maybe we are the most oppressive source in the world today. But nobody ever mentioned that to me. I was only taught that Jesus died for my sins and I needed to confess and accept him as my personal Lord and Savior, which I did more than once, by the way. But never once did anybody ever tell me that I should accept Jesus as my political Lord and Savior. It's taken me longer to figure that out. But if we know anything at all about this whole encounter, this whole thing that happened between uh, Good Friday and Easter, we have to acknowledge that these things are connected. 
If it was simply a matter of a vengeful God demanding retribution for the sins of the world and out of his grace and mercy offered Jesus up, why didn't he just go and jump off a building? There's a death. Or why didn't he do like Abraham did when he took Isaac up and built an altar and was ready to offer him as a sacrifice? Why didn't he get one of his disciples to take him up to Gethsemane and ram him through with a sword? That would have accomplished the same thing if that's what it was all about. But it was more than that. There's more to this. There's a surplus of meaning in the Easter story. Jesus died on a cross as an act of nonviolent resistance to all the evil social structures of the world then and now. This was his final decisive act of defiance. But then God committed an equally elaborate act of defiance. To all of these expressions of evil, he raised him from the dead. That's the meaning of Easter. That God got involved. God wasn't simply a dispassionate judge seeking blood and retribution, sitting on a throne uninvolved. God was there. When Jesus was raised from the dead, brothers and sisters, God was there. The resurrection and the crucifixion are two sides of the same coin. The God of the oppressed was acting decisively with us and for us. So maybe the Emmaus Road says to us today that we can't go home again. We can't go home again, certainly not the same way. We have all been changed. We have all been transformed. And the greatest thing that we can do for ourselves and for one another is to accept what all of this involves, the costly sacrifice of Jesus' life, the costly sacrifice of George Floyd, the costly sacrifice of Michael Brown and Breonna Taylor and so many others. That's what it requires of us is that we get ready to do a new thing and to find a new path and a new road. God bless you. God bless us all as we pursue and we find that new path and that new way. Amen. Okay. Ruth. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. That's beautiful. Let me just get to my gallery view. So, tomorrow, we just wanted to say a word about tomorrow, and I wanted to invite um, Lloyd Jordan. Tomorrow, we, we have our hearing before the Zoning Commission, and so Lloyd will share a little word about what that will be like. But uh, it's certainly part of our journey toward a new way for this congregation. And it's a long journey. <laughs> Lloyd? Yes, Ruth, uh, uh, thank you. You talk about a long journey. <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, we've been battle, you know, we've been everybody. And uh, just so you know how, how hard that um, uh, your pastors have been working and, and others have been working on this uh, submission and preparing for this hearing. Uh, I've been working a lot. And Ruth and Brian have put a lot of energy into this whole process, as well as some others. Um, and this weekend, it's been whirlwind for some of us, uh, changing documents, having conversations, meeting, and trying to modify theories and, and <laughs> work out strategies and play the guess who game. and what have you for this hearing. And Ruth, uh, you started off talking about a long journey and I started off saying before I lost my place is that we started this in 2014, mm -hmm. 2014, mm -hmm. and we're still at it. Mm -hmm. um, so tomorrow at four o'clock, we go in front of the zoning commission and the zoning commission is the body who can give us a uh, development authority to to develop our project. 
And as you know, just in a nutshell, presently our site is not zoned to do the things that we want to do. Um, it's, it's a, our site hasn't been rezoned in umpteen years, uh, even though everything else on our block or all those places around us have been rezoned uh, several times, but they left that little spot where others could have been kind to include us in their rezoning years and years ago, but didn't. So now we're on our own trying to get our rezoning so that we just don't look like a freak on that whole square <laughs> as, <you know. laughs> as we become dwarfed. But more importantly, this request we're making for our development, which includes a um, selling the parking lot area and to other little pieces of land so that we can generate the, the money necessary to build a new church. This is a venture on which it is a necessity for Westminster and not one that becomes a luxury. And I, I just want everybody to understand that. We have probably close to $2 million in capital improvement needs that we need to do at our church. And but for Brian and others putting their finger in the dike for when their leak happens in our <laughs> building and, and what have you, we would be in trouble. So this development helps save our church. Um, and so we have tried to work, at least we thought we were working cooperatively with our neighbors. Um, and, and here's the beautiful part about this. Tomorrow we go in front of the zoning commission uh, we generally have support, a broad range, wide group of support, even for those people who, who normally um, are in opposition to any type of development. We've been blessed to have them with us on this, on this, on this matter. However, we've learned that our friends, <laughs> I'm going to be honest, Ruth, I'm just so sorry, <laughs> that our friends that we've worked with for several years, not just in regards to this project, but have worked with on other things in regards to supporting the Southwest neighborhood has stabbed us. The, the Ward 6 ANC 6D has voted against our proposal, even though we've worked with them, Brian, I think you and I had our first meeting with them in 2017 and have worked with them ever since, mm -hmm. are not supporting us, as well as an ANC commissioner who we thought was joined at the hips with us late on Friday night files in opposition to our uh, our, our former ANC commissioner, our most recent ANC commissioner filed an opposition. So we're gonna need your prayers as we go into this um, tomorrow. There's one other issue with this, um, is that our present, the present compass, comprehensive plan, the comprehensive plan sets off the, the zoning map, the zoning policies for any particular area, does not support what we're doing However, pending, and it's been pending at least almost two years now, a year and a half, a change in the zoning regulations that would support us, uh, would sort of support us from A to Z. And all the preliminary positions for that comprehensive plan, there's several different pieces to it. And every piece, except for the, every piece has passed that includes us changing our zone. The final piece has not been heard yet, and that will be heard maybe till the end of April, 1st of May by the, by, by the DC Council. So we're gonna need your prayers tomorrow. We're gonna to need your prayers that the commissioners see through, uh, that the commissioners do what's right, that they understand the necessity for this development for Westminster, for its future growth, uh, and that they do what's right and maybe that, our, uh, that if you bump into and see some of our ANC people or understand that they need to get on and do the right thing. Westminster has been good to Southwest. It's been so very good to Southwest. Not because we're looking for anything in return, it's just that who we are as a, as a, as a church. Um, and, but sometimes you need your friends to help. You, you, know, you can't just keep giving, giving, giving sometimes and when you need, 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 nobody's there for you, right? So this is a kind of a situation where we are. I'm sorry, I know I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> rambling, but I'm telling you, I'm pissed off. Yeah. Um, I'm very pissed off. And Brian and Ruth can't probably say that for all kinds of reasons, but they're <laughs> pissed off too. And um, so we're going to right. need prayer tonight. We have this hearing tomorrow at 4, 4 p.m. Thanks, Ruth. Back back. Thank you, Lloyd. Thank you, Lloyd. You've been our champion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well... A little bit of good news, it's not just a little bit. How much do you think that the children of this church uh, inspired us to give for one great hour of sharing? Anybody want to hazard a guess in the chat? 
hazard a guess in the chat? Anybody? Anybody? Come on, somebody hazard a guess. Okay. Well, okay, that was the goal. 3,000 was the goal. We did better than that. We did better than that. We did better than that. As of this morning, the total is $5,170 that the children have inspired us to give. That's the most, that's double uh, what we normally give to One Great Hour of Sharing. And uh, I just, it's just a sign, not only of how much we respect our children and that we want them to know that we're listening to them and that we care about their future and this earth, but that there's just a spirit of generosity that's overflowing in our church right now. And so in, in spite of everything, you know, any opposition that we're getting, it, don't worry about it, okay, friends? We, we, we're just gonna keep doing what we do and, and God's gonna be with us. So I'm not worried about that. Make sure you check out the things that are happening this week. There's the link to the zoning hearing if you wanna go on and hear that, you can, you can just listen to it. Uh, if you want to come on Tuesday night at seven, we're having a social justice coordinating team meeting. If you're interested in how we do social justice and in the breadth and depth of social justice in our church, join us that night at 7 p.m. There's a link there for that. And then on, um, what was the next thing? Oh, the Pearl, the Pearl. You might have seen the Post uh, article that Courtney Malloy wrote, wrote about our the event we're showing Thursday night. It's a Zoom event. And then we're going to, at eight o'clock, we're going to walk over to the duck, Southwest Duck Pond and have a commemoration for the 77 African-Americans who risked their lives to get on board that boat and uh, try to get to freedom. And so be part of that. You're welcome to come over to the park if you're in the area, we'd love to see you. So uh, this is always the time to give, continue giving, the church still operates. And um, thank you so much for your generosity. And I'll turn it over to Ann DiBiazzi for our prayers today. Thanks, Ruth. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> if you all could please join me in the prayers of the people. I'm going to open with a prayer I adapted from a Reverend Shannon Smith. And with these prayers, Lord, we as a community ask for God's redemptive presence in the world today. Mm -hmm. Let us pray. Mm -hmm. Healer of our every ill, especially our fractured creation, we come before you to make our petitions known. Hear our cries for healing of body, mind, and spirit. Mm -hmm. We know that already you are at work among us, showing us the way to recovery from the toxicities and grief of our time. You remind us that you are in the boat with us mm -hmm. in the midst of difficult times. We give you thanks for this path of following you, even when you call us to cross over from one way of life to another. Mm -hmm. We pray especially for the victims of gun violence this week and for their families. We pray for those that have been incarcerated. We pray for our neighbors who struggle to afford healthy and safe housing. And we pray that the church's redevelopment process moves forward smoothly and swiftly. We pray that we will continue to learn and see and know how our actions affect others, not just ourselves. We give thanks for the wake up calls that people like Beth Moore are sounding. Mm. And we pray for the fortitude to move this journey forward alongside them. We give thanks for the courage of the many activists and educators who help wake us up to this storm mm -hmm. and to see that we have it within our power to calm that storm, to restore the earth's wholeness. Mm -hmm. We ask for courage and encouragement to reevaluate how we as a church can join this effort now and into the future. Amen. And we pray this day <laughs> together and you can join me in following along in the chat. Pat gives prayers of thanks for Yolanda completing her course of chemo and being in remission. For Lincoln's successful surgery and no need for chemo. For Jane's successful surgery and the start of chemo. 
and for continued healing for cousin Joyce in her recovery from her stroke. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. Chad prays for Jerry's brother who is undergoing a series of heart surgeries. May his recovery be swift and complete. Lord, Lord hear our hear prayer. Our prayer. Pat is thankful to receive a second vaccine shot this morning and is praying for a sooner ending of this pandemic. Lord, Lord, Lord hear our prayers. prayers. Mike Smith prays for a prayer of intercession on behalf of Mr. Danny Robinson's full recovery. Lord, and he also, Lord, 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 Lord. Lord. Mike also lifts prayers for the success of the church's objective tomorrow at the Board of Zoning Adjustment Hearing. Lauren asked for prayers for her father, Ben Alexander. He had surgery last week mm. and a minor setback this weekend. Lord, Lord, Anne pray, prays for a dear friend who is experiencing depression and resisting professional help. Lord, 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 Lord. George prays for, uh, gives prayers of thanks for the leadership of our pastors and Lord on the redevelopment and also thanks for the children of this church and that our church is always going beyond with our action. Lord, oh, Lord, Lord hear our prayers. prayers. And more prayers from Marcia, thanking Lord for his leadership in our new building. Lord, Lord, Lord hear our prayers. Our, prayer. prayer. oh. our Redeemer, we know you live. These things we pray in that trust, using the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, our Mother, Mother our Lord, 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 and give forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not in not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Before this final song, I just want to, I, I was trying to get the prayer and I put it in wrong. For Bob Listu, still in ICU at GW this morning, unable to have any visitors, which is very difficult. So for Bob and Jean, God, hear yeah, our prayers. Hear our prayer. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. <laughs> 